In the cinematic sea of prequels, sequels, reboots, and reimaginings, the Movie Retakes podcast considers the merits and desires for Hollywood's new takes on our beloved movie classics. Brothers Matt and Chris Sully examine the latest retake franchises, pitch their own original retake visions, and share their love for the movies that made them. This is Big Brother Chris Sully. And this is Sully of the Half Scale, Matt Sully. We're so happy to have you come back for another quality episode of Movie Retakes. This one is all about Snowpiercer. From a very young age, Mr. Wolford's love of locomotives was apparent. When I grow up, I will trade forever. And we're not going to talk about just the movie. We're going to talk a little bit about the upcoming television show as well with Jennifer Connelly. Oh, the lovely Jennifer Connelly. And uh, if you haven't done any subscribing or liking or clicking and all the positive ways that you can do that, please reach out and do that on YouTube, Twitter, and all the other, you know where you are, all the podcast places. Make sure you subscribe because you (laughs) want to get each one of these episodes. Like my brother said, we have a Snowpiercer-focused episode for you today, and during the podcast we'll answer some very important questions, including What lie did Bong Joon-ho tell to save his movie? Where can you get a movie ticket for less than three bucks? And which actor loved the taste of the Snowpiercer protein blocks? Mm-mm, 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 gelatinous blocks. Yummy. <laughs> <laughs> they just look disgusting, but I don't know, we eat jello, right? So I guess it's... Isn't that all like, didn't we find out it's all just horse toenails or something? Uh, I've heard some stories. I don't want to, I don't want to know how the sausage is made, man. That's, uh, (laughs) I'm just going to enjoy it. (laughs) Yeah, that's fine. If it's some sort of meat byproduct, I don't care. I I don't care what's in a chicken nugget. I know it's all beaks and toenails, but give it to me. I'll eat it. (laughs) With the right sauce, anything goes down okay. There was an actual TV show with uh, Jamie Oliver, the chef, where he went into schools and showed kids how chicken nuggets are made. And the whole process is disgusting. And at the end, he's like, all right, so do you guys want to eat these chicken nuggets or these really good chicken strips? And the kids are all like, chicken nuggets! Yeah. Like, didn't phase them at all. They don't care. <laughs> yeah, I remember I watched that uh, the documentary, um, what's it called, where the guy eats McDonald's for like a month oh, for every meal. Oh, supersize me. Supersize me. And there was about five minutes after that was over where I'm like, ugh, I'm never eating McDonald's again. But then you drive by a McDonald's, you're like, but they're, everything's so delicious. Yep. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't really care. It's all so good. What are you watching on television these days? Or streaming Ooh. or whatever? Yeah, it's just one of those terms that just sticks around. Like, I still say I record things, but who uses a tape anymore, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I've been spending a lot of time uh, consuming all kinds of content. Movies and TV. I uh, found a great new show on Amazon Prime called Upload with Robbie Amell. Really enjoying that one. That is a very interesting take on uh, a digital afterlife, if you will. Oh. Still watching Tacoma FD. Uh, by the Broken Lizards guys. Love that. It's one of the only shows that's putting out any new content right now. I guess they had recorded it all before all the craziness went down. And oh, so there's I still see. a few new episodes. It's from the vault. Huh? Basically. Yeah, I think they just were lucky and had it canned at the right time. Hmm. Uh, a lot of podcasts listening while I do my daily run. More Mark Marin, WTF, more ID10T with Chris Hardwick. This week he had on Alexandra Daddario, which, whew. I'm in love with her. Uh, mm. You got to check her out if you haven't. Uh, Nerd Profiles, a podcast I was on, recorded an episode this Friday and it dropped Sunday with my good buddy Pablo, who I met at STCC years ago. Uh, and then I got some new friends that started a new podcast called The Average Nerd. They put out their very first episode, so shout out to them. And lots of gaming. Still yeah. playing Animal Crossing every day. I'm addicted. Call of Duty, Warzone, Candy Crush, and I got back to some Halo 5. Mm. Uh, popping skulls and splitting wigs over the weekend, having a blast with that. <laughs> uh, I uh, finished up season two of Kingdom. Uh, that was really enjoyable. Man, that one comes out of the gate hot. Like uh, It ends uh, season one where they're in this, uh, uh, like a zombie horde is coming to, to attack them. And uh, season two starts out where they're just coming at them. So it's uh, it's exciting from the beginning and uh, ended up being a pretty good season. Uh, I also just started uh, Tales from the Loop. Uh, you had talked about that earlier and uh, 
I was interested. It was on my list to watch, and I've I've started. I'm like uh, four episodes in, and I'm enjoying it. It's a slow paced show, but yeah. But I think, I mean, I like it so far. So yeah, that's good. Uh, watch Goonies again. Um, yeah, because we that was when that Josh Gad had that Goonies reunion, got me hyped about it, and uh, so obviously I had to go and watch that again. And it's still a lot of fun. I have been listening to The Plot Thickens, the new podcast from uh, Turner Classic Movies. Uh, ben Mankiewicz is hosting, uh, and this they're, they're basically going to do a season about, uh, or, or each season is going to feature basically a, a, a someone of interest in the movie industry, and this one's Peter Bogdanovich, which I honestly didn't know much about him. So far, it's been very interesting, but shooting off of that um i've had a movie on my to watch list forever uh, that for whatever reason i kept putting off and i finally watched the last picture show um and man that was a good movie like i yeah i i had heard people talk about it forever and say how good it was and i you know i had basic expectations i try not to get too built up when people recommend things or whatever but I gotta say that was a solid film. It's just a small town um, uh, highlight, basically, of these people that are stuck, uh, generations of people stuck in this small town, and basically, you know, what are their lives like? And it, yeah, it's there's nothing huge other than that. That's all it is. But it's a, it's a great story, and the acting's really great in it. Um, so people in there that you would know, like. Um, uh, Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepherd and um, uh, a few other people. I'd have to look it up, but uh, yeah, everybody in there was solid. It was it was a great movie. Well, before we get into snow per- piercer, purser, whatever, one of those snowy terms, uh, I do have a special segment today, and I still haven't named the segment. You guys got to help me out. You got to give me something. <laughs> I don't know what to call it. I want to call it off script or maybe second unit. I don't know. Anyway, mm. it's just a bunch of me blabbing. <laughs> This one is about foreign cinema. In terms of gross revenue, English language films are vastly overrepresented among the highest grossing films of all time. Among the top 100 highest grossing films, 99 of them are in English, though it could be argued that Minions is in part a foreign language film. This trend (laughs) has to do with not only where movies are made and how prevalent the English language is spoken, but also international ticket prices. In a country that charges on average $9 a ticket, the U.S. will naturally see higher revenue over India, where the ticket price is less than $3. Looking at ticket sales rather than box office gross, Indian cinema is hugely popular and lucrative. For 2019, the U.S. sold 1.2 billion movie tickets. That same year in India saw 1.03 billion tickets sold the majority of which were not for English-language films. The Hindi films, a.k.a. Bollywood movies, often take 43% of the sales, with uh, Telugu and Tamil languages picking up much of the remaining pie. Because they make so many movies. uh, And I forgot to put down the thing. It's like thousands of movies every year they make. Wow. Yeah, just constantly turning them out. So now imagine the number of Indians located outside India and think of the possibilities Demand for Bollywood cinema availability could bring worldwide. When you scroll down to the bottom of Netflix, you see the hundreds of Indian movies available. You sort of get an idea of where that could go. The point is, there's a vast and expanding catalog of movies out there that most American moviegoers will never watch. And it's mainly because they're foreign. People are hesitant to venture outside their comfort zones. And for many foreign languages, they're a big barrier to overcome. It makes sense. Some movies have managed to find favor with the U.S. audiences, however, and I'm thinking of like Del Toro's Pan's Labyrinth, Benini's Life is Beautiful, Lee's Couching, Tr- Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, not the Couching Tiger, that's a different one, Juno's <laughs> Amelie, and uh, Junho's Parasite, which everybody knows now from the Academy Awards. Parasite winning Best Picture is an amazing achievement, but Best Picture winners and blockbusters are categories with rare overlap. I counted three in the top 200 highest grossing films. And about 75% of the U.S. box office earnings for Parasite were made after its success at the Oscars. I don't know that we'll ever see American theaters clearing multiple screens for the latest Chinese import or Bollywood hit, though I know some theaters do have select showings for just those sort of films. Streaming, however, is a different game, and this is where I think maybe we'll see an uptick in foreign language film consumption. I'm a fan of good movies with little regard for language borders, but I know I've barely scratched the surface of foreign cinema. 
Thanks to Netflix, however, I'm watching shows like The Korean Kingdom that I mentioned earlier, and I'm scratching the walls in anticipation of Dark Season 3, a show which is entirely in German. But audiences aren't the only issue with welcoming exposure to foreign language films. Even directors who make great movies in their native tongue often switch to English. Jean-Pierre Jeunot did Alien Resurrection, Del Toro made Hellboy, Pacific Rim, Ang Lee directed Brokeback Mountain, The Life of Pi, Bong Joon-ho made Snowpiercer. The question is, if they kept all those movies in their own language, would they have been as successful? The answer is likely no. We are creatures of comfort, and many people just loathe subtitles. So foreign language TV and movies will likely forever reach only a fraction of American consumers. So it's up to us to look beyond the Hollywood machine and seek out entertainment in every corner of the world, or else we're going to miss some truly extraordinary work. After all, even the original Mad Max was dubbed. Why? Because distributors believed American audiences would find the Australian accent too difficult to understand. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And I'm I'm with the majority of people and I don't like reading subtitles and I don't like dubs. Maybe there's another answer down the road. There's another way to relay that that audio. Well, so I I've had basically an evolution uh over time or at least a change. I'm not going to go ahead and be judgmental about, you know, people uh struggling to to get into this sort of stuff because I get it. Uh I used to dismiss uh, uh, all these films as well. Uh, but then when I did start watching some foreign language stuff, I usually watch the dubbed ones. Um, but that in itself is a deterrent because the acting, you know, it's not given to actors in most cases. It's just people that show up and read the lines and they're awful. If you watch the original Mad Max, those guys just aren't as good. It's not as good a movie because if you watch the dub version, those guys just aren't in it. You know, the actors, the, the the voice actors just aren't in it. I, I went out and made a special run to find uh, a, a copy of Mad Max with the original track, on, the audio track on there. And it's so much better. Like you start to actually see that these guys are legit actors and yep. the emotions of the lines and everything are fantastic. And I do think we, we're kind of at a point where, I mean, the, the anime and all that is is massive now. And yep. a lot of that stuff um, is dubbed. Um, some of it's not, and and people seem to be fans of that as well, and they don't mind the subtitles. But the stuff that is dubbed is far improved. They are hiring actors uh, yep. to actually read the stuff with emotion and uh, and carry it out as if they were the original actors. And I think um, I think it works a lot better now. You know, it, it's very interesting you bring that up. I had forgotten about it, but I last year or two years ago, I had the opportunity to go down to Dallas to Flower Mound, which is just outside of Dallas, where Funimation is housed. And Funimation takes uh, many of the most popular uh, anime shows like Dragon Ball Z and My Hero Academia, and there's a list a mile long. And within a week of them coming out overseas... They have an entire cast on hand that live in that area that come in and record their parts, and they then they put it up on their streaming channel as well as, as, well as Crunchyroll and several mm. other places, and it has turned into a big business, not only for Funimation, to the tune of millions and millions of dollars, but for those actors. There are a few that stand out now that oh, tour, right. in addition to doing the voiceover work, they tour to all the cons and sign autographs. On That's those cool. characters, even though they weren't the original designers or the original voices. There's a whole different market for that here. There, there is a lot of work for voice actors. And mm -hmm. I, I think um, there's still, when you when you discover who does voices on these different cartoons and stuff you watch, you see that they do it on multiple shows. And yep. it's, a, it's a small sort of community. I, I think it's expanding, but it's, I guess, the people that do it well immediately become, you know, high demand. And hopefully it's lucrative as well. What that one guy uh, who does uh, Archer, uh, who does oh, Archer's voice. Oh, H. John Benjamin. Yeah. What he's on Bob's Burgers. Yep. Uh, what else does he do? I know he does uh, a couple other ones. He does commercials for Arby's now. Uh, but as far as voiceover work, I, I know I've heard him in other places, but I can't remember where. Yeah. I know I know he's been on, uh, does voices for a few shows I've watched. There was an old yeah. um, cartoon that I used to watch called Home Movies. And I can't remember where, what channel that was on. It was all that. Um, you remember Doctor Katz? Like it was all that, like that yeah. squiggly, awful animation. Yep. Like just like children drew it. But this was yep. appropriate, where it was basically featuring uh, these young kids, and he was uh, like a soccer coach on the show. And ah. dude was hilarious. That show was funny. Uh, animation was poor, but I guess that was the point. Like the the voice acting was better. Hey, hey.
All right, so we are going to talk about Snowpiercer, um, which I know this isn't the section where we give our opinions or whatever, but dang it, I like this movie a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah, Same. so let's hear a little little bit about Snowpiercer. In a future where a failed climate change experiment has killed all life except for the lucky few who boarded the Snowpiercer, a train that travels around the globe, a new class system emerges. I don't know if I pasted that wrong or it's just an oddly formed sentence or what. But anyway, it's in there. <laughs> it's a big yep. train. Get on that train and ride it. Get oh, nice. on that train. <laughs> all right, so uh, <laughs> Chris Evans is in this. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all the movies he's in, but I, I did want to make a note here. I'm going to go ahead and throw him out as maybe the actor who starred in the most movies based on comics. Because oh. looking through the list... We've yep. got the Fantastic Fours. He uh -huh. voiced Casey Jones in TMNT. He was in The Losers, which nobody talks about that movie. But oh, yeah. it's a very good movie. And yep. I'm going to go ahead and say that that's, besides like Batman franchises, that's probably one of the best DC movies. Like yep. I, I'm not a big fan of the DC stuff. Marvel's way better uh, in every capacity. Uh, but uh, uh, other than the Batman ones, like that and uh, probably the... Um, uh, Teen Titans <laughs> uh, animated movie are probably the, like the top DC films. Uh, he's also in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, which is based on a comic. He's in the Captain yep. Americas, the Avengers, and Snowpiercer is based on a comic. So I don't. Holy I didn't, cow! I didn't do the math, but it's it's got to be like upwards of a, like a dozen comic book movie adaptations. That's impressive. Yeah, that's really impressive. Speaking of, I saw a really cool. Uh, I don't know if it's a statue or somebody just did it for fun the other day, but it was. Uh, Chris Evans' character in Scott Pilgrim versus the world with the skateboard fighting Captain America with the shield. And I thought oh, that was freaking great, cool. man. cool. Yeah. He's good in that movie, too. That whole movie's great. I love that movie. It is. Um, who else is in this? Song Kang Ho, uh, who did 24 movies prior to Snowpiercer and has done nine since. This guy's a work. Wow. Ed Harris, uh, you probably know from Westworld uh, or The Rock, or and he's going to be in the upcoming Top Gun Maverick. Sir John Hurt, who way back when was an alien uh he's also in harry potter and the deathly hallows both of those he's in the hellboy uh movies uh tilda swinton um she's in tons of things and rock wow. solid and everything she's one of my favorite actresses of all time mm -hmm. she's just amazing uh you might know her from dr strange grand budapest hotel chronicles of narnia or constantine um jamie bell is in this he's in rocket man he was also in fantastic four but i think the different fantastic four series um yes jumper and if you can recall a long time ago especially when you see his face he's little billy elliot you remember that movie back what? in 2000 that's him that's billy elliot oh man yeah that's great yeah uh, th that movie was fantastic i haven't watched it in a long time but i remember liking that movie a lot huh. uh octavia spencer's in this she's from uh, hidden figures and the help i like her a lot too she's good uh i yep. think we're gonna see a lot of stuff from her uh, over the next few years uh uh, Evan Bremner uh, was from Train Spotting, uh, and Koa Sung, who was in uh, The Host, that was another uh, Bong Joon Ho movie, and that's who directed this. Bong Joon Ho, who did uh, Parasite, so you probably recognize his name from that. He also did Okja, Mother, and The Host. Uh, he's also uh, a big writer. He wrote all those movies that I just said. Um, wow. Uh, the Okja, Parasite, Mother, and The Host. Kelly Masterson also wrote on this. Uh, and he worked on Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Uh, that's a movie with Philip Seymour Hoffman and Ethan Hawke. It's a disturbing, and it's a good movie, but it's messed Very. up. Um, so there's there's some good writing in this as well. And I, honestly, this uh, this is like the fourth time I've seen this, and paying attention more to the writing and all the clues they give and the stuff they say where it comes back later on. You see more every time you watch this movie. It's, it's really good. Uh, this came out in 2013 so uh, this is the first movie we've done that is in not in the 80s um so we have jumped quite a few decades ahead um which is fantastic people were asking you know are we are we just going to spend our lives in the 80s which why wouldn't you um right. but um there is other movies out there in other time periods now this i say 2013 uh, because that's when it came out in South Korea. Internationally, however, we're going with 2014, um, June 27th in the U.S. And so um, just for that, because most of our focus has been 
uh, U.S. release dates. I'm going to stick with 2014 uh, in uh, our, our fun facts around that time. The big box office winners, it wasn't that long ago, so everybody should remember these. Transformers, Age of Extinction, uh, The Hobbit, Battle of the Five Armies, Guardians of the Galaxy came out then. Uh, the Hunger Games, uh, Mark, Mockingjay Part 1, X-Men Days of Future Past, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, and Interstellar. So those were all the big box office winners that year. A lot of, man, you could sit, I mean, we know we're inundated with all the superhero stuff, and but every one of those is science fiction or fantasy. Yeah. I guess that's just the world we live in now. Like, a, 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 There's great stories to be told, but that's just impressive that everything that's come out is sci-fi and fantasy. You talk about nerds unite. Nerds are ruling the box office. Hell yeah. And there was a uh, obviously a span of time from the South Korean release to the U.S. That delay in the U.S. release was caused by Harvey Weinstein, who wanted 20 minutes of footage edited and opening and closing monologues added. But Bong declined in response. A free Snowpiercer petition campaign demanding the director's cut of the film be released in the U.S. and eventually Bong succeeded in getting the film released in an uncut form. This was achieved through a change in distributors to Radius TWC, which meant the film only received a limited release in art house cinemas uh, on July 3rd, 2014. Thanks to positive reviews, Snowpiercer then earned a wider U.S. release and was played in 150 theaters, which isn't massive, but you know, it's at least something. So it would have been that that's kind of a what if moment there. And it's not like yep. it, it's not like it didn't end up being a great movie and, and, and Bong didn't end up being a successful director, but maybe things would have shifted there if he'd stuck with Weinstein, done his cut, because then Weinstein would have promoted it more, got it more theaters. It probably would have been a pretty big hit. But at the same time, that those movies that were coming out in 2014, I mean, I, we knew we knew Chris Evans, right? But, well, Captain America, Winter Soldier, that was Winter Soldier. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, we already knew him, but I don't know. Yeah, that could have been marketed to the point where that probably would have been a blockbuster as well, I think. But how long, what's the runtime on this? Two hours, six minutes. If you change 20 minutes of that, that is a significant portion of your film. And I, I'm kind of proud of him. Uh, I, I applaud him for sticking to his guns and not caving to that because he had a vision. Why change that? I, I don't, yeah. I'm glad he didn't cave. Yeah, yeah. most of the stuff that Weinstein went, he basically wanted to make it more of an action film. And it still yeah. is an action movie. But, you know, there's a lot of, of story in this as well, which I could totally mm -hmm. see. Yeah, 20 minutes, uh, he probably would have cut all, the action, all this dialogue stuff, the exploration of the train, explaining a lot of the history and all that. And just we would have just had another fight with axes and stuff, which, you know, I would have welcomed that as well. But at the same time, I really like the movie that came out of this. So this made... 86 million uh that's worldwide this only made four million in the u.s uh wow and that's that's on a uh, 39 million dollar budget so yeah all, all the money it made was elsewhere not in the u.s and hugely rated 94 percent on rotten tomatoes that is an achievement very and well rare. deserved well deserved i like i said this is the fourth time i watched it i think i i see a little bit more every time and yep. i enjoy it just as much every time like this is one of those i went into well i think most people uh because it wasn't a huge deal in the u.s where it was one of those kind of people were talking about it in the shadows or whatever it's like they just stumbled on it and uh those are some of my favorite movies like where it's it's that mm -hmm. you, you feel like you've discovered something you know like uh, you've stumbled on on some gym that's uh, been sitting in the shadows, needed to be dusted off, and, and you watch it, and you really enjoy it. And you go in so cold, cold, <laughs> and that's the pun there. Ah. Uh, sorry about that. That wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I'll see myself out. But you go into this not knowing anything and uh, just being so surprised the whole time, pleasantly, like every every turn. Like you, you think it's about to become some sort of generic thing. Uh, where they uh, they give you new pieces of information. They des they decide to go a different route with a character. Or they make choices that you don't see very often, and uh, and uh, everything turns out really good. I, I like this movie a lot. What do, what do you think? Oh, I definitely am a fan. Uh, I had a little bit different experience going into it because I had started running in the circles of the Comic-Con conventions right around the time that the hubbub around this internationally was starting to get big, and I was eagerly awaiting a U.S. release. Sadly, couldn't get to the theater to see it. I wish I had, but as soon as it was available to rent, I jumped on it. Uh, and, but even having seen trailers did not know what this film was about, and I didn't do a lot of reading on it. Uh, but 
Chris Evans being in it, huge selling point for me. I'm a big fan of his work. I think he's a great actor. He's been in, like you said, many, many of my favorite films. And uh, so I went in eager, but uninformed, which Mm. I think is some of my best movie uh, viewing experiences. The less I know, especially with a film like this that has some twists and turns, makes for a much better mo- uh, video or movie viewing experience. Mm-hmm. And, and it's it's strange because I, um, if you pull back, I mean, just reading that synopsis, it's like this sounds to me like a you know one of those fun sci-fi short stories that somebody would write people on a train you know the 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 world is frozen over and the only survivors are on a train that goes around the whole globe i mean that sounds stupid like yeah it, you know at best you're gonna get a nice 20 minute film with some cool special effects or something out of this but to take that and turn it into something not only a a feature like a two-hour movie but every two hours feels uh, every minute feels well deserved and it needs to be yep. on the screen like you don't feel like this is drawn out at all and it's a great drama. It's a great story. The actors are, are fantastic. The characters are great. The action is awesome. Like, uh, And it is just unrelenting in its gruesomeness as well. Um, yep. And then there's a nice little fable at the end as well, learning about humanity and our place in the system and all that sort of stuff as well, uh, and how that ultimately works out in society and classes and all that. Beyond the Gate section after section precisely where they've always been and where they'll always be all adding up to what the train it, it's got everything the the if anything it should be closer to 100 percent uh, on rotten tomatoes there's very little about this i can complain about i really like you called out the uh the one year travel of the train and how that sounded like a stupid concept and right in the middle of the movie when they get to the the school car of the train, the one little girl is like, everybody was so stupid. They didn't realize how genius Wilford was. And they talk, they basically explain that and make fun of making fun of it, which is great. No, he just, he handles everything so well. And this is all him. I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, it's a good script. um, And the actors did a fantastic job, but it's, it's mostly him as a director. I think he's a good director. We recently watched Parasite and uh, I, had not seen i'd been wanting to watch it i it's still a, have it's, not it's a great movie man uh, and th- yep. that's another one honestly people talk about spoilers and stuff i pretty much don't pay attention to anything so i went into this into parasite cult too despite it being an award winner and all that and everybody talking about it i didn't know anything about it um i, I got no I knew, clue oh okay cool so i'm not <laughs> yeah um it's also very good and um not knowing anything about it makes it that much more fun to experience. Yeah. Overall, he's a fantastic director. If you haven't watched Snowpiercer, if you haven't watched Parasite, go go watch both of those. They're they're really good. I've got a few notes that I made. Uh my my patented bulleted item system here. Uh just the name of the the train, the rattling arc. They reference it in the beginning. I didn't quite get that. I mean it's an arc and it does rattle down the tracks, but that seemed too easy. I don't think that's I thought the that name, was interesting. Though. You what? Like I don't think that's the name though. I think it is called the Snowpiercer. They just I guess they just referred to that as that that rattling arc called the Snowpiercer. It it's yeah. strange. I caught that too. That was odd. Yeah, it was I think it was used as a proper noun in the way it was written on the screen. I think it was it was capitalized. I'll have to go back because I thought that was interesting. Uh, I couldn't believe they're on that train for like, I made these notes in order as I was watching, but to know that they were on that train for 17, 18 years, dear God, can you imagine? And for, and and as is pointed out later in the film, no one had ever gone from one end of the train all the way to the other. Chris Evans character, Curtis was the first to do that. Yeah. I thought that was insane. Uh, that chick that's like, uh, his, uh, second in command that, that has the gun in the final scenes. Yeah. When we first meet her, she gets hit in the head with a shoe and bleeds and then eats it. Yeah. Like what the, she is twisted. Yeah, she's and what's odd. he, he references, she's having some emotional issues or something like that at, towards the end. I'm like, Oh yeah, she is. <laughs> I just put her down as yellow jacket chick Yeah, in my notes. Uh, and then I made this note before, because I totally forgot the plot twist in this. I, I know I watched it years ago, and I've I've forgotten just enough where I could enjoy it almost like a first go, uh, a first movie viewing experience again. I was like in my notes, I was like, wait a minute, they got no bullets, 
But then later, there's a whole segment where they're shooting between cars. That was convenient that they didn't have bullets. But then, of course, we get to the end of the film and we find out there was a reason for that. Whether or not it's specifically explained or not, it was by design. Uh, I love that they stop in the middle of one of the giant battle scenes to celebrate Happy New Year. That cracked yeah. me up. <laughs> that whole that whole section of the movie is just amazing. Like the the Crazy. action in there, the fighting, and yeah, you're, you're, it's tense the whole time. And then and, and then it all goes dark, and they have to fight in the dark. And yeah, and then just stopping in the middle to, to celebrate the New Year's. <laughs> That's hilarious. It was yeah. It was like oh, let's all pause. He's got the megaphone. Let's all pause and celebrate real quick. And then okay, back to the action. Yeah, <laughs> I thought yeah, that was, was great. Cool. Yeah, even my next bullet was the long tunnel night vision segment. Just wow. And when I did read, I think we'll probably get to it in the uh, the cool behind the scenes stuff at the end. So I won't reference it specifically right now. But when they come running in with the torches on screen, just wow. That was just visually stunning. Yeah. I love that. Um, Tilda Swinton. Passengers. This is not you. This is disorder. This is size 10 chaos. I, again, you said it. I, I think she's a magnificent actress. I, I love the way she gets into each of the characters she plays. She's She can be creepy AF. She can be very convincing. I don't know where or why that scene where she takes her teeth out <laughs> is so unique. And she's such a good actress that you can see her like exposing weakness uh, in herself and in her character just by that simple maneuver. Yeah. Like, why is that powerful? But somehow she made it powerful. I'm like, I don't understand what I just saw, but that was cool. Yeah, she she sort of steals the show in this one. Oh, like, yeah. She's she's power. Like, when it, she first, get, first gets up there and starts to talk, you're just like, she just becomes that character, and it's amazing. She does something that only the best of the best actors and actresses do, and that is uh, they apply nervous tics and mannerisms to a character that most people are never able to do. And those little, those little things make them so much more real. The speech impediments, the, the tics of an eye, motions in the head and hands, like the way she does these actions with her hands that we learn later in the film serve a purpose. Oh. Right. That was yeah. a really cool touch. That was the director yeah. telling her to do those, but still she executed them perfectly. And the way they, they zoomed in on the hands when she did it, yeah. you know they're going to reference it again in the film, and they do. Um, the Wilford origin story and song in the, yeah. the, the, the cart with the kids. Oh, man. What happens if the engine stops? We all freeze and die. But will it stop or will it stop? No, no. Can you tell us why? I was I literally laughed out loud and I thought that I, I can't wait to do the podcast and to have that audio segment of the song somewhere in the podcast. Oh, it's good. It probably had just played. <laughs> yep. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. I'm going to listen back. I'm going to laugh again yeah. and then laugh at us laughing at us laughing. Yeah, that's going to be great. <laughs> Those were my big bullet takeaways. I'll be honest. I, I watched this. Uh, I was a little tired when I watched it. That first hour and 10 minutes it's rocking along it's good setup we got the action then there gets this segment where they're chatting uh him and uh uh sung kang ho uh name gung minso minsu i can't half those names i couldn't pronounce in the movie mm. where they're having a nice conversation back and forth that's key to the movie and i fell asleep three times watching that no <laughs> and and finally got up made a cup of coffee <laughs> And got back into it because I knew it was so good and so important. That uh, speech from Chris Evans at that moment, like he's so good. About, oh my god, that's the best acting he's ever done. That yeah, was, I agree. It was amazing. You felt it because it's a that is a gut wrenching story, and uh, yep, it gives so much background on his character and how he's evolved and stuff, and just what's happened with the origin of the train. And I think a lot of people would have made the choice to either show that like they would actually go film it yep which was not necessary because you got you understood everything from his expression and the way he told the story we didn't need to see that and though and that's another thing too is that how the story unfolds is yep. so important like we spend so much time like we literally start at the back of the train 
and work our way forward. They don't. They, the only time we see people that are from the front of the train it was when they visit the back of the train. Like we we yep. move car by car as an audience up the line, and they could have done that differently. Like the only thing that's really is, uh, I feel. I guess I didn't really notice it before as they opened the movie was showing the the rockets that are being launched into space. Yep. And I don't really know why he did that. That's the only thing where it's like, I don't need, we didn't get anything from that. That's an odd one. Yeah. I I felt that was very out of place uh, and set a tone that I, I tried to just ignore this time around. When I saw it, I was like, that doesn't match the rest of the film. That that doesn't work for me. I'm going to pretend I didn't just see that. Yeah. That's that another, may have been and, one of the only flaws. Uh, one, one of the new things I noticed this time around, too, is the opening credits. He had this whole thing about highlighting um, basically loops. So like the O's and Snowpiercer being this uh, because oh. it's, a, it's a commentary not about just the train going around the planet, but also kind of how we all fit together in this sort of this cycle of existence and stuff, how we rely on each other. And I thought that was I didn't catch that. It's subtle, but it's uh, once you and I think that's that's an advantage of seeing the movie a few times. Like I said, I see things now that I didn't see before. And and that uh, we haven't really gotten to like a whole, you know, Sully uh, rating system where how many stars or thumbs or whatever. Uh, but for me, and when I rate a movie, uh, rewatchability is huge. a huge factor. It, a movie can be fantastic, but if I only ever want to see it once and I don't ever want to go back and watch it again, it loses quite a bit. Yeah. About the only time that's okay is when there's a giant twist. Well, but even I, then, yeah, yeah, I talk about it a lot in different settings. But The Matrix, one of my all-time favorite films, I have watched probably 150 times at this point. Still catching stuff. Yeah. Still catching little nods and little wording and phrases and stuff that uh, I didn't catch in the first 149 viewings. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's nuts. But that's yeah. that's my overall take from the film. I, I think one thing I just did remember in what you were talking about was uh, sometimes not showing something, mm-hmm. just referring to it like he did during that speech. They had that dude uh, hold his arm out for the longest time, seven minutes, while he's wearing the Flava Flay clock around his neck. <laughs> and then he pulls his arm in and they hit it with that giant hammer, but they don't actually show the hit. Oh, no yeah. reason for it. Mm. You get it. You get the vibe. You get the feel through the eyes of the people watching that event or or averting their eyes, which I think that's so powerful. You don't have to show everything, even even in a film that's so uh, over the top with the blood and guts. They still decided not to show that exact instant, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, he's uh, and and when you see Parasite, you you pick up more on that too. But he's he's very good at um setting setting you up for what's coming. Like go ahead and placing something in your mind, uh, so like w- before he he smashes the dude's uh, arm, uh, we we have a we have a long take of that hammer, just yep. that massive hammer that is there, and we all know what's about to happen. So you're uh-huh. right, we d- we don't need to see the impact. We've already imagined it a dozen times before he ever swung. Yep. So that's that's brilliance of uh, directing, in my opinion. It's kind of like reading a book. He's planted all those seeds, and it's up to you to visualize it. And you'll probably visualize something that's even more disturbing or graphic than he could ever show on screen. This ain't Saul. If you want that, go watch Saul. Uh, you know, or any of the eighty-two Saul films. You know. Yeah. So those, those, you know, the audience comes in, and we already have an ability to to carry through on a lot of stuff, whether you've you've shown it to us or not. So we we mm-hmm. already come in armed and. And that's what's great about movies is there's a there's interaction there. We we all watch the same movie, but in a way we've we've added our own uh, elements every time we watch it. So it's personal, mm-hmm. and that's that's pretty great. All right, so we are going to do some Snowpiercer pitches, and this is a fun time, everybody, because we get to like I said just then we get to use our imaginations, and uh, we get to uh, tell a story that uh, we would like to see uh, of what Snowpiercer could become in a sequel. And I don't know if you've made a television series or a, a movie or, or what, but um, I'd like to hear yours if you want Okay, to go I'll first. go first. Uh, before I jump into mine, we'd, I would like to plant a little seed, if I may, uh, for mm-hmm. everyone. Uh, we have a secret code word that might come into play in a future giveaway, and that code word is STEAK. S T E A K steak, and I think if you've just watched Snowpiercer, you know why that is a secret code word. So, yeah. 
Now for my pitch of a Snowpiercer retake. I have decided to go with a sequel. I had several options that I was really thinking through. Now, we know they're doing this TV series. Uh, I don't know much about it at all. I have seen a trailer. It's going to be interesting to see what they do, but I just can't imagine this going on for seasons. I, I just don't know how you do that. So in my mind, that definitely doesn't play as another film. Uh, what I'm going to do is a direct sequel where the events take place immediately at the end of the first movie. Um, and it's called Snowpiercers. Hmm. Like you go from alien to aliens. I'm going Snowpiercer to Snowpiercers. Uh, let me give you my synopsis, and then I will give you my casting. I will go ahead and say the same actress that played Yona is back, Ko Asung. So here's my synopsis, which I will read because I put a lot of time into it. Uh, the second film picks up exactly at the end of the first with Yona and young Timmy heading out into the snow. They stop to look at that polar bear, uh, which clearly means that life has found a way to survive. When it dawns on Yona that Wilford, played by Ed Harris originally, would have seen this as a possibility. He would have understood that the train was not the end of the journey, but a means to survive the freezing temperatures caused by CW7. Yona and Timmy return to the train wreckage to comb over the remains and find their way back to the lead car. They find a journal written by Wilford meant to be handed off to Curtis that explains the inner workings of the train and the plan that he had set in place for the creation of a new civilization to be executed when the world once again became inhabitable. During their discovery, several other passengers who somehow survived the crash find Yona and Timmy and the group, now 12 people strong, decide to head off in search of Wilford's bunker, which he established before setting the train in motion 18 years before. This new group of snowpiercers, that's the title, it's a play on words because now they're going out into the snow, okay? Uh -huh. I, if, if you have to explain it, it's not so good, but I did it anyway. <laughs> this new group of snowpiercers must endure the harsh weather, wild animals, and limited supplies as they follow the instructions left behind in Wolford's journal. To most of the group, the world is a strange place that they had only heard about from the older people on the train, and they are clearly not prepared for such an adventure. The new year mark, as we referenced when we were talking about the film, uh, they had just passed a day or two prior, is the destination, as that was the original point or the origin point of the train, very close to the bunker in the mountains that Wilford had constructed. But due to the weather conditions and treacherous terrain, the journey takes months and there are many losses along the way. During their journey, the group comes across the remains of pockets of civilization that had clearly tried to survive the cold, but had not fared at all. Luckily, these areas are full of supplies, pretty much everything except food, and the group's biggest struggle becomes defending themselves from the harsh weather. After a very long journey, the remaining members of the group, now Yona and three others, poor Timmy did not make it, arrive at the secret entrance to Wilford's bunker, found at the base of a large mountain, marked only by a small logo, just like the ones found at the front and back of the rattling arc. That W that could flip around to be the phone now flips around with the press of a plate to reveal a number pad. The number that is needed is in Wilford's journal, so they punch it in. Mm. The rock formation opens to reveal an entry hall into a huge facility built into the mountain. The team, now hungry and tired at a level even worse than their time on the train, walks down the hallway. A faint noise, not heard at the entrance, grows louder as they make their way down the hallway, and they see light coming from a turn at the end. The team makes their way to that turn, and as they approach it, they hear voices. They enter a large area to find what looks like a cafeteria, and at the other end, people. A small group of five people dressed in jumpsuits stare back at Yona and the others. At first, the group from the train fear the worst, but they're greeted by these new people with open arms. Both groups are shocked to see anyone else, but the jumpsuit-clad team quickly reveal that they have been waiting on just such a day. They had been in this mountain for 18 years with hopes mm. that the passengers of the Rattling Ark would one day arrive. Wilford had put two plans in motion, with the hope being that he and the passengers of the train would one day return to the mountain facility, but that facility was also a backup plan in case the train failed. Yona and the team from the train are escorted to their new rooms in the mountain facility. They shower, and they lay down to rest. The next morning, they are greeted with breakfast, real eggs, bacon, toast. They share the tales of their trip and allow themselves a moment to bask in the hope of the life ahead of them. We fast forward a few months and see both teams working and living together in harmony, and then, 
in the last minutes of the film, we see the secret mountain entrance open once again from the outside. A large group, several dozens people strong, make their way down to the cafeteria. The leader of the new group meets our bunker dwellers, holding a similar journal to the one found in Wilford's engine room car. He opens his mouth and says, I am Wilford's son, and we are here to take back the mountain facility. Roll the end credits. Mm. Nice. Well, so is this going to be a two-parter? <laughs> it could be. I, I like the idea that uh, this kind of wraps up their journey. They think it's over. It could even be maybe a post credit scene if you really wanted to go nuts. But I feel like this this world had to be much bigger. It, you can't. They they open the first movie and say the world is everyone's extinct. Oh yeah, but by the way, there's this train. Mm-hmm. Do you are you seriously telling me that this guy uh, Wilford who was preaching that uh, this was going to happen that no one else listened? So I imagine, and he's a smart guy, and he has clearly an abundance of wealth. He would have had several plans in play because he was about survival. So I, I felt like there's there's probably a much greater, bigger story at play, and maybe that's multiple films that we get to see it all. Yeah, and the um, the the graphic novels, there's uh, like four of them or something uh, that do tell different stories at different time periods. So, oh, I didn't know about those. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so we we do actually get an expansion of the story. I think one of them does cover um, uh, Earth as the event is happening, um, and then another one is a little uh, before the Snowpiercer, and then I think another one's afterward. So we do we do get an expansion of the story. I don't know what all they're going to cover, uh, but yeah, there is more to the story, and um, mm. I I would be interested to go and actually read those. Uh, find them and see see what the story is that they've told maybe the those stories are the premise for the new television show it could be i i didn't see that written anywhere but it yeah, i could have just missed it hmm. so who do you have uh you said you have casting for this as well oh yeah yeah so really everybody is kind of a backdrop i like that the first one doesn't have a lot of known names mm-hmm. uh for the other cast members i mean a few octavia spencer and jamie bell yeah, we know them from other things, but everybody else was kind of an unknown. Uh, this one, I feel like the most important roles are uh, Yona from the first film, and then who is the leader of this group that comes in at the end? And uh, I like I like this actor, Edward Norton, as Wilford's son, mm. which I think is very believable if you look at Ed Harris and you look at Edward Norton as well. So Yeah. We've had this a few times. There's, um, it's just going to continue to happen where we've got some similarities. Yeah. Um, uh. Uh, I spent more time on the story uh, this go around, and so also I didn't have, I didn't do any casting. Um, I would like to see where we can a continuation. So Yona and uh, Bong Joon Ho as a uh, director uh, would be nice. But yeah, I didn't get into uh, didn't get to casting. I, I would like to go back and think about that. But uh, but here's the here's here's my pitch. And I don't have a cool name for it or anything. So just Snowpiercer. Out in the cold. Well, I don't, I don't we'll know. let the marketing team figure that out. Yeah, no. that's not my responsibility. <laughs> the wreckage of the snow piercer is covered in ice and snow and is slowly blending into the barren, stark white landscape. The tracks of Yona and Timmy have long since been covered by snow, but the railroad tracks begin to shake, the weather clear, and we see another train in the distance. A second Wilford super train is slowing before the wreckage of the first. When the train stops after a long silence, one of the doors of the train opens and a hesitant passenger steps out. Then there are more people, armed forces and first-class passengers, their bright clothes visible for miles against the white earth. Then there's an explosion at the tail end of the long train and dozens of the tail enders spill out of the broken heap. When a struggle ensues, we see people slaughtered on both sides of the conflict while many others flee into the mountains. There's shouting and gunshots and silence. The world is quiet again. Six months later, A small group of people are seen huddled in one of the train cars, a combination of living quarters for both humans and livestock. The people are well clothed, even if the clothes are dirty, and decently fed, though they share the meat from a recently cooked chicken. The dozen people seem to have an uneasy alliance, bickering over possessions and getting into physical fights. When a noise comes from outside, however, they all work in unison to seal the train car off. They are scared, hiding from raiders who have again come to pillage what food is left aboard the second train. The frightened group says, that what the pillagers have come for is likely the last of the food, and from the angry muffled shouts and violent bangs against the metal walls, it seems the raiders are upset by what little left there is to steal. 
The next time the Raiders come, says someone from the group, it will be for the small band of surviving passengers. After the raid is over, they decide they have to leave the train. A journey over mountains, fighting wolves, harsh storms, and amongst themselves until they reach what appears to be a small town constructed from the remains of cars, ships, and storage containers. Using reflective surfaces, the people have cleared and heated a patch of earth where they are growing food and raising polar bears for meat, but the town is far from prosperous. The town cautiously brings them in, and when the townspeople find out they are train survivors, there's infighting over whether or not the group should be allowed to stay. For days, the group is watched, kept away from the children, though one townsman confesses he was the survivor of the first train, part of the rebellion that led to its destruction. He says how weak they were individually, but their collective hatred for the evil, selfish people of the front gave them strength. Sometimes, he says, you need a proper villain to help humanity thrive. As he finishes the story, he begins to realize that this group of train folk may not all have been from the tail end. Before he can confirm this, the raiders show up. The second train group thinks they must have tracked them from the wreck, but a villager meets the raiders, pointing out their new guests. The raiders capture the visitors and travel back to their own base, a massive underground facility complete with electricity and running water. The Wilford Incorporated logo is all over the walls and appears to be a factory (laughs) and testing facility for the trains that existed prior to Earth freezing over. As the group waits in the holding room, they try to determine if the raiders and the others they met were perhaps also in some way tied to the train, and more importantly, which car selections they were from. Sections they were from. If they were from an opposing class of passengers, they could make trouble for the group, so the captives decide not to confess anything about which end of the train they were from. One by one, members of the group are taken away from interrogation as the audience is left to make their own determination as to the origins of everyone. So that's what I want to play with throughout is we don't really know who was from what class or whatever and so they're all gonna have a blend because they stole clothes from other people and they're eating you know all that sort of stuff uh one man who talks escape plans appears to possibly be a former military personnel on the train a woman who's bothered by just about everything comes across as one of the former privileged an older man frail but generous and caring just wants them all to live through this new struggle a young couple neutral in their behavior are determined to stay together in the end we don't know which section any one of them was from only that they learned to survive together Each person comes back from their interrogation, telling of a one-armed man who drilled them for answers while an Asian girl stood by his side, staring. When the prissy woman doesn't return from her interrogation, the group is taken from holding and shown their work areas and living quarters. It's clear that they will be staying against their will. The old man, however, is taken from the group, weeping. They assume he's seen as a useless commodity and will likely be killed. The couple and the others begin work on an assembly line. They have a daily routine, and they work alongside others who have come from different parts of the world, either stumbling into the raiders on patrol or taken from villagers, villages and towns they had established. We discovered that the raiders are taking resources wherever they find them and bringing them back to the base for their own use and having the workers construct new trains so they can expand their global reach. The couple works the assembly line. The tough military guy is recruited as a guard. The prissy woman is a cleaner. Among the workers, there are struggles in a gang-like pecking order. It's prison life where too many people have forced groups to form to survive. Not all the workers are able to make it in that life. Some are murdered by their own, and when someone attempts to run, they are publicly slaughtered by the leader's men. Others cling to existence as sad as it may be. Life here is better than on the train, as some say, but others wish for more. They all agree that if they want to choose what life they want, they would need to leave the old Wilford base. The couple, the cleaner, and the guard work together and form an escape plan. When their plan fails, it's revealed that Yona, the Asian girl with clairvoyant powers, saw what they were going to do and told their leader, the one-armed man. He gathers the entire base and executes the guard and the prissy cleaning woman. Yona is clearly upset by the event, and it's evident she has been physically and emotionally beaten down, but only steps in when the leader calls for the young couple to be executed as well. Yona convinces him instead to put them in the breeding program where they are producing the next generation of loyal servants. The young man becomes an assistant with injecting women to impregnate them, and the young woman is one of the women tasked with carrying children. The leader, in Genghis Khan style, it's actually Genghis Khan, comes in weekly to donate his sperm (laughs) for the breeding, and we know now that all the babies are his, and in many cases he rapes the women rather than relying on scientific methods. Time passes, the young woman becomes pregnant, and the couple isn't entirely sure who the father is. Witnessing his partner's rape time and again, the young man wants to kill the leader, but the young woman wants to escape. The rebellious couple finds an unlikely ally in Yona. She lets them know their baby will become important for the new world. She wants to her her powers have basically increased over time. Mm-hmm. She wants to help them escape on a recently completed train, but says she'll stay behind to kill the leader so the raiders won't be forced to hunt the couple down. Through a time lapse, we watch the young couple's baby grow up on a farm, become leader of a community, then that community wars with the neighboring town. As time passes, it's apparent the boy is ruthless and terrible, starting a war with the disparate survivors of humanity. Yona narrates to explain that this war would bring the small towns together to defeat him, 
which ultimately combine their resources to better expand humanity and extend the viability of human survival. In the last part of the montage, we see an older Yona killing the couple's son. Thousands of people gathered in celebration. Wow. So rather than him being the savior of humanity as a good guy, we need him to be a villain so everybody comes together to take his ass down. Didn't see that. Yeah, as soon as you said that Yona had that vision, I instantly had the thought, oh, it's, yeah, okay. He's going to be the good guy. He's going to be the savior. Yeah, you're right. That's good. Yeah, he's uh, John Connor, but now he's not. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, he's he's the Terminator. I don't know. (laughs) Whatever. I love it. Yeah, that's good. I can't believe we both went with a bunker in the mountains. But it does it does beg the question, why the train in the first one at all? Yeah, I don't know. Well, so there's only the slight... I was thinking how dumb it was, too. There is a there is an explanation in that Wilford film where it says, originally it was a luxury liner that needed to... Liner? Whatever. A luxury yeah. train that had to be impervious to super cold and super hot so he didn't build it for the purpose of an arc it just happened to suit that purpose well yep that's a good point yeah yeah because the idea of of them having to move all the time and run into these frozen pockets of ice and snow and then like you're in yours the second train must come to a stop because of the problem with the first one well and so yeah Right. Yeah, they they just have no choice. They can't they can't move on. Yeah. Yep. And, and there is subtleties like to explain why they what so if the train is impervious to all these conditions, it doesn't have to keep moving, but it does because she explains in there that it gets water f- from when it breaks up the snow and ice. So for True. them to get water onto the train, they have to keep moving to scoop up the snow and the ice. So that part makes sense. I just wish the train tracks like and how it gripped the tracks was a better system yeah no doubt <laughs> it's just constantly <laughs> about to fall off but it needs to be like that disney tram that kind of wraps around yes yeah yeah, exactly. yeah that would have been way better yeah had so yeah had they known in advance that this was a preparation for a uh a frozen wasteland they probably would have heated rail tracks but uh well, and by being on the move, I mean, in your story, you actually played into the fact that because they were stationary, the the uh, groups outside the train knew where to attack over and over and over again. If the train's moving and only comes around once a year, it would take anybody that wasn't on the train forever to even figure that out. They would have been fine for a long time if it weren't for stuff on the tracks. Yeah. And you notice, <laughs> you and I both dismissed Timmy. Like I didn't even write him in. I, I, I was know. Got, I was got a whole thing where <laughs> he was involved, but I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do with him. I'm like, just... I'm like, come on, a five year old boy in a frozen tundra. I yeah. no, he can't fend for himself. He's dependent on others, and they're worried about themselves. I, the odds were slim to none. Yeah, poor Timmy. We barely knew you. Yeah, and I think Yona going out as inexperienced as she was. Uh, with life on earth she probably wouldn't survive either without somebody else's help like she's not gonna learn how to farm all of a sudden or kill a no polar but she man. was cl- a little clairvoyant and that could sure have its benefits true but that's not gonna grow potatoes like uh, nope. it would keep nope. her from getting bitten by a wolf maybe but uh yeah no. even then uh i imagine well that's another thing that that's uh there's a there's a few problems with snowpiercer but we sure you know they would have been so weakened that them fighting anyone in some sort of rebellion probably wouldn't. It would have been over in less than a minute. Um, you know, they, oh, they only ate cockroaches. Uh, so Ugh. I I don't know. That provides protein, but not. I wouldn't think enough. And then there is something that comes up that I don't think I. It, it's like a goof, which is glaring this time around. Where the matches the, yep. the kid the kid takes the matches. And then runs off with them, and then they're just they're in his case later on when they need them. And the number of matches there were yeah. some, uh, yeah, the way they were used, there shouldn't have been one left at the end. I think so is what the, I read as well. There was something in there where somebody did an editing thing or a reshoot or yeah. whatever and forgot a story, and it could have been fixed. You actually, all you needed to do was cut the kid stealing them because yep. they probably added that to explain how he would uh, light the torch later on but we didn't yep. need that we could have assumed there was other matches on the ship yeah so or they started the fire from friction or something else yeah sure yeah you yeah. can make fire yeah um yeah so that 
they really just literally cutting out three seconds of the film would fix that. I think those kind of things are funny and they're interesting. Some people get straight up bent out of shape about movies because of that kind of stuff. Clearly, they've never edited a film. Oh, God. Because can you imagine trying to keep track of all that crap? Yeah. yeah it's I, could, I couldn't fathom. All right. So I think those are both uh, quality pitches, but we're not making these movies. There is a television show, however, coming out. Mm. And so we do want to talk a little bit about that because there are some things that we're questioning, you know, as much as we can discover about this. And here's the synopsis. This is set seven years after the world has become a frozen wasteland. So that actually places us before prequel. the Snowpiercer movie. It's a prequel. Snowpiercer, the television series, centers on the remnants of humanity who inhabit a giant perpetually moving train that circles the globe. So seven years... If I'm right, that would actually put us at that story they tell about the people, one of the yes. other revolutions. Yes, yeah. you're right. So that's ah. what this is going to be about. And this thing is already renewed for a second season, which I don't understand how that's possible. So, mm. I mean, that makes me feel good about wanting to watch it. I don't generally jump into a show. Um, without multiple seasons now that means one of two things to me either they went ahead and filmed both seasons all at once because that would be way cheaper on budget or and this actually i'm surprised more studios haven't done this there is a huge thing i don't know what you would what you would call this exactly a fear of getting into a show because of how often shows are canceled and i think you've even mentioned it before and mm -hmm. i know i have it's like i'm not getting in on season one unless i know there's going to be more is this just a marketing ploy did they just say this so we wouldn't give up before season one had even finished airing? I don't know. And I don't know if I've said this on the show, but basically I want a, I think I have, a, I want a contract. I want, I want to know that you're going to give us a show and you're going to support your own show. Like, why should we keep turning up to watch these shows? And you cancel them, not when they don't have viewers. There's still millions of people watching these shows that you've canceled. Millions. And yep. you've, you count it as a failure. Well, any failures on your part, my friend, it, it, for not supporting your own programming. It used to put on a television show that sucked probably the first two seasons, and then they got better, and then people started showing up. What Seinfeld? Seinfeld, Seinfeld was awful. <laughs> we said it at the same time. It was a terrible show. <laughs> but starting season three, it actually got genuinely funny. Yep. And and then it was one of the top shows forever, and. You, you, you've got to change how this is done. Stop making a million shows. Yep. Give us one new show a year and make it solid and support your own damn show. And don't make a series that's going to continue on forever. I'm sorry that you're not going to have friends again. And it's not going to carry on for however many ridiculous seasons that show went on until everybody dates everybody. And you've got you've told every stupid trope possible. Tell us that there is a story here that will be resolved in three seasons four seasons yep. whatever so we know what we're getting into like we're all in this together man we want good I, entertainment i totally agree and honestly i would say that these studios and television stations are run by people that are concerned about nothing but the money yet where's the financial smarts in spending millions of dollars in production and salaries millions of dollars in advertising and then not even showing all the episodes how much investment did you put in? And like uh, the perfect example is always Firefly. There's 13 episodes. They only showed 10 and mm. they showed them out of order. They yeah. showed them out of order for God's sake. Yeah. Nothing was handled right on that show. All right. So who's going to be in this? Well, we know Jennifer Connelly is going to be in this. And what's so funny is I, I know her so much that I forgot to go and add in what all she's been in. So I'm going to look that up. Career uh, opportunities. Yep. Labyrinth. Beautiful mind. Um, she yep. was also in uh, this. She was actually in uh, Spider Man Homecoming for a second. Um, she was well, in the MCU. She is Friday. Remember, I, I think I talked about that before. She's the voice of Friday, the AI that takes over after um, Jarvis hmm. becomes Vision. And let us not forget, or if you want to, but she was in Hulk. Um, oh yeah yeah uh she was also in blood diamond um dark water pollock requiem for a dream 
Dark City. All right, we're going back pretty far. But oh man, uh, Requiem for a Dream is one twisted ass flick. Yeah, and I can't I can't watch that again. And I think we did mention this on the Top Gun episode. She is going to be in Top Gun Maverick as well. So it's exciting to see that she's she's coming back. Um, Agreed. And you know what? I like her. Yeah, she's she's a decent actress, and uh, I feel like she's going to be one of these women that's just going to be lovely at any age, you know? So um, I, I could totally see her carrying on for quite a while. All right, there's more people in this than Jennifer Connelly. Uh, David Diggs, uh, he it was in uh, The Get Down and Blackish. Also does a lot of voice work. Uh, he's on uh, did voices for Star Wars, Resistance, Bob's Burgers, and he was the voice of Dose in Ferdinand. Uh, Mickey Sumner is in this. Uh, was an American Maid and Marriage Story. Sheila Vand, who was on Twenty Four Legacy, Whisco, Whiskey Tango, Foxtrot, and Argo. Lena Hall, which was in all oh, she was on uh, All My Children. Allison Wright uh, was in a few TV shows. Castle Castle Rock. Sneaky Pete, The Americans. Uh, Ido Goldberg was in Westworld, uh, the Get Shorty television show, and uh, Peaky Blinders as well. So uh, quite a few TV actors here. Uh, Aaron Glenane uh, was on a show called 68 Whiskey and a miniseries called Picnic at Hanging Rock. Karen Conoval was on The X-Files, Jerk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, and The Good Doctor. Um, and oddly enough... I didn't go through the entire cast, but I found it odd uh, that quite a few of them did voices on BoJack Horseman. And I was oh trying to figure out if there was some sort of producer tie-in that, uh, you know, a writer tie-in of why so many of them. Or maybe it's just one of those things like they were looking for people with certain voices, maybe. Um, and uh, I don't know. But that's strange. This- a, lot of, a lot of more than BoJack. This is interesting. You didn't say this name. I scrolled way down on IMDb, and IMDb is showing two seasons worth of content. They show 20 episodes next to Jennifer Connelly's name, listed as 2020-2021. But if you get way down the list, Sean Bean is listed, and it only says 10 episodes next to his name. So my first thought was, oh, crap, he's going to die again because no. he's known for dying and everything. He's only listed for 2021. Yeah. Yeah. I did That's that. That's interesting. Yeah, which I, I wish we could go ahead and just skip ahead because uh, Sean Bean is amazing. I love that guy. And um, Maybe yeah, he'll live this time. That's something nice to look forward to, that he'll be in season two. So, yeah, as far as what I've read, he's not going to be in season one, but he will be in season two. Uh, the writers on this a uh, guy named Graham Manson who worked on Orphan Black uh, and also wrote the movie Cube, if you recall that movie, Ooh. back in 1997. I really enjoyed that movie. A bunch of random strangers wake up in this metallic room and figure out they're in this big uh, Rubik's Cube labyrinth sort of social experiment where they have to tra- to escape. They have to travel through all these different rooms and essentially, um, uh, they're trapped rooms, so different things happen if you go in the wrong room, and not all of them make it out. Uh, but it's actually pretty entertaining, and it's one of those movies where you, you think about after, it's like, you know, uh, budget-wise, like, and, and set design and everything, they only had to make one room, and they yeah. slightly change it. Like, you filmed in one location. Genius. Uh, yeah, slightly different lighting, maybe a different arrangement or whatever. But yeah, the budget on that could have been really cheap because there no, there's nobody in it. Like they're all no name actors, and yeah. not all of them are great either. Um, but it's kind of worth a worth a viewing. Um, the The series is going to come out May seventeenth, two thousand twenty. So this is uh, a first for our episodes um, in a few cases where not only we moved out of the eighties, but this is going to be the first uh, retake to actually come out very close to our episode. So wow, uh, you, you might you might think we planned this. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. <laughs> we did actually. <laughs> hey, yeah, yay us. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Uh, I'd like. I'd, I'm curious uh, for listeners to uh, give some feedback. How many people are are interested in this show? And um, yeah, and once it actually. Uh, comes on how many are watching it and how many you know are enjoying it and uh i got a couple questions i got a couple questions for you one did you watch the trailer yes 
Okay. I did too. I don't remember crap from it. I just know I saw it and I was like, I'm in because it's called Snowpiercer. Yeah. Uh, but two, I'm guessing since it's TNT, it's going to be a week to week release, not an all available at once. Which would you prefer? Oh, I don't do the week to week anymore. Yeah, I need yeah. to stream it. I don't know anybody who's. So somebody Edgar Wright shared something on Twitter the other day uh, up about a show that is going to air uh, at a certain time, and it was a, he, he took a picture of like I don't know if it was a TV guide or if what still exists that shows what's you know the newspaper shows what's coming out or whatever. But I'm like, who does this? Like yeah. as if it's so archaic, the thought of looking in to see what's going to come on, and I I just honestly I don't even when I think about watching stuff. I zero percent of me is thinking about what's on television. I I pull up Netflix, I pull up Crave, I pull up all these other things, or I'll go to YouTube, um, or bring up a podcast. But I have no idea what's on television. I don't know what networks air what. I don't care. Eventually, if it's a success, they'll get onto the streaming networks, and then I'll watch it. Then and I'm also the guy who uh, uh, will wait uh, thirty years for a video game to become ninety nine cents so that I'll buy it and then play it because I don't care about what's new. If the thing's cool and it's timeless enough, I'll get it. I'm sure people listening are like, uh, so far, they're like, there's a lot of similarities between these Sully brothers, but this is one we differ on yeah. vastly. I am day one video game release guy, take the day off and play it to stay ahead of everybody. I am watch the show week to week or all on the weekend it drops because of I don't want anything spoiled. I don't want anybody to tell me what happens before I get to see the reveal. Uh, I am very different, and, and I, I don't say I detest the week to week releases. I definitely think there are some positives to it. Uh, and the one the one thing that makes week to week release good is the conversations that go on between the episodes with your friends. Like Lost was a prime example of how great that can be. But that was in a time where we didn't have a streaming option. That's right. And so now I think even that is lost because find somebody else that's going to watch this week to week. I think the only show I can think of or that's happening now and people are talking or Westworld is yeah. Westworld. Other yeah. than that, I can't cite anything where people are like, oh, did you see the latest Goldbergs? I mean, uh, other than me. But yeah, still. no, Lost is literally the last show that I planned to watch when it aired. Yep. And oh, man, I did. Yeah, I didn't miss him. Like I showed up every time now. I, I just don't care. I've been burned so many times on shows where I get into stuff and they cancel it. And so I, I honestly, I don't care anymore. I have no heart for it. I, I will wait until the show is completely done. And then I'll wait for people to talk about it and say, that was a great show. I'm like, okay, cool. And then I'll check it out. Uh, I'm fine with waiting. No big deal. All right. Uh, a couple of notes here. So this was in development at TNT for over three years. Whoa. Um, and during that time, the series faced numerous production issues and delays arising from creative differences between the series producers and the network. The series remained in development hell until May 2019 when it was announced that the series would instead air on TNT's sister network, TBS, for a spring 2020 release and that it was already renewed for a second season. However, in September 2019, the decision to change networks was reversed. So I don't know what's going on over there. Weird. But that doesn't really give me a lot of confidence either. So, mm. Well, if you compare TNT and TBS, which one is the is the bigger name? It'd be TNT, wouldn't it? I guess. I mean, my eyes yeah. are about the same, but I'm wondering if that's a positive sign that they decided to bring it back to TNT. Hmm. Yeah. Some strange things, but we'll see. All right. It's a fun time. It's trivia time. Yay. We're going to learn some cool things about Snowpiercer. I'm going to hit it off. Director Bong Joon-ho often clashed with producer Harvey Weinstein, who frequently interfered in order to create his vision of the film. Among the many requests, the producer insisted of having the fish scene removed in favor of more action. Bong, who considered it his favorite shot in the film, was adamant to keep it in. He told the producer that he wanted to keep the shot for personal reason, as a tribute to his late father, who was a fisherman. Upon hearing this, Weinstein said that family is very important to him, so he granted Bong to keep the shot. In an interview, the director said, It was a fucking lie. My father was not a fisherman. <laughs> he just wanted to I love made. that. That's great. I, 
I, I, I read that uh, earlier today, and I'm so glad that he stuck to his guns and found a way to work it out. And knowing what we know about Weinstein now, way to stick it to the man, dude. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> I love Weinstein. it. Yeah, moron. Uh, Sir John Hurt's character name, Gilliam, is an homage to Terry Gilliam, a director of similarly bleak end of the world titles such as Brazil, 12 Monkeys, and The Zero Theorem. By the way, I love 12 Monkeys. Yeah, I love Terry Gilliam. Like, his movies are quirky and uh, he covered he covers uh, quite a spectrum though like uh, yeah. there's a lot of quirky but there's also some dark stuff and then there's this amazing color thing he just he's amazing he's uh, he's really good um Jamie Bell's character in the film is named Edgar and was named after the director Edgar Wright so that's a lot of nods crazy. here yeah yeah writer and director Bong Jun Ho explained that the protein block was made by combining seaweed tangle sugar and gelatin jamie bell hated it while tilda swinton liked it uh rebel wilson was supposed to play the part of claude the right hand man so to speak to the trains engineer and conductor wilford so your yellow jacket woman yeah that that was gonna be rebel wilson i'll be honest when i saw that character in the film i got a rebel wilson vibe off of her a little bit Hmm. so they they had a, a look they wanted I guess so. Or that chick from Workaholics, the blonde on there, that's their goofy friend that says the weird crap all the time. Yeah. I can't remember her name. Uh, Next one. According to filmmakers, the revolt of the sevens female leader is Nam Kung Minsu's Song Kang Ho's wife and Yona Ko Asung's mother. Interesting. That's I, I, I had read that before I went and rewatched this. And so I was trying to pay attention to see if there was any hint of that. And there is a little where they, they, when they see the, uh, the frozen images of, of the people that are still out there, that he talks about yep. that the leader was a Inuit woman and, and knows, he knows details about them. And um, he, he doesn't, well, she was born on the train and she's 17 so she would have been 10 and we don't know if the mom was even around with them she she could have been the inuit woman who he doesn't say that it was her mother or anything uh but that's who it was um but the fact that he knows details and the way that he's looking out the window and stuff he's uh there's something in there and i was also thinking uh, i was wondering if that was why they were in prison was that uh, it oh. involved that in some way? But he said something around the same time where he says every year yep. they look out the window. So I don't think that was it. I don't know what the offense was to put both of them in prison, but that's that's interesting. I'd like to know more on that too. Same. Bong Joon Ho first wrote the part of Mason with John C. Riley in mind, but then adapted the character for Tilda Swinton. Uh, though he intentionally left lines of Mason being referred to in the masculine form in the script, which shows up in the movie. They call her Sir. Yeah, I noticed that, and uh, it's funny because at at uh, Funko, the Funko Funcast, the podcast I'm on there, we're all group of friends, and a long time ago, we decided to call everyone sir, mm. F- females and males alike, just because it was a sign of respect and it was easier, and we'll do it in public sometimes, and people look at us like we're nuts. I'll oh. turn to this Hillary, who's clearly a female, a very attractive lady, and I'll be like, sir, 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 and everybody be like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, <laughs> they think we're nuts. Uh, and I love that. I can't imagine what that film would have been like with John C. Riley in that role. Like I, I see him, I think comedy. I know he's capable of more, but I don't know. My mind would have not been in the right place. I don't think. I've seen him in dramatic roles. He's a really good actor. Like he he's good. If you, uh, you ever watch uh, Magnolia, uh, you should see him in that. He's uh, fantastic in that. I have been. I've heard that brought up ten times this year, and I've yet to see it. I need to go ahead and break down and watch it. Yeah. Check it out. The glasses that Mason was wearing were originally Tilda Swinton's. When writer and director Bong Joon Ho visited her, they played with her children's play box and found them. Huh. Interesting. So she used to be super blind because those things are thick, I guess. No doubt. Uh, There are 1,001 sections in the train, and 26 sections appear during the course of the film. Bong had wanted to show a zoo section if the budget allowed him, but it didn't wind up happening. I wondered about that. It felt like when they were going through that we saw it all, but then I had questions about like, where are all the animals? Where do they poop? Like there were things that, uh, that didn't make sense. And I just assumed we didn't see all the cars, but then my thought kept going too. like, 
if you want to go all the way back to the water, you got to go through all, you got to go through the kids' school. You got to go through all these other rooms. Like there was no, they didn't leave a hallway down the side. You always had to go down the middle of everything, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, I think they were meant to be compartmentalized where people in one, well, but that's not the case. Again, this wasn't built for that purpose. It became right. an arc. Yeah. So, yeah. And it was about maximizing space too. So. Yeah. Uh, the markings on the engine, a circle with a narrow S on it, represent the yin-yang, the same relationship between the front and the back of the train. The front can't survive without the children of the back, and the back can't survive without the food from the front. A perfect symbiotic relationship. And then there's a bunch of goofy teenagers dancing on, on drugs all yeah. the time, so I don't know where they fit into the <laughs> circle of life, but I guess. Uh, They're ready the to fight at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's true. They want their drugs back. Uh, all the artist drawings in the movie are drawn by Jean-Marc Rochette, the original illustrator of the Snowpiercer graphic novel. So oh. he got to be in there. And they're really good. I love all those Talking drawings. Talking about like the uh, drawings of the kids? Yeah. He does all those, those charcoal are, drawings. Yeah, Those good. were good. And the man without an arm that was meant to lead them all. And yeah, there were some really cool drawings in there. I like his style. Yeah. I love that. I love the trivia. So many fun things. Yeah, I wish there was some more for this, uh, but uh, there there wasn't a ton. But I feel like we got some good stuff in there. Well, I uh, I enjoyed talking about Snowpiercer. Um, it is a a great movie. I think we both recommend you should go out and watch it. Um, Absolutely, you're gonna watch the television series. I may wait a few years, <laughs> but um, you you let me know if it's any good. And I um, mean, we don't have to wait long. It's uh, two weeks from today when we're recording, so I'm excited about that. Yeah, if we get this out in a couple days, you'll still be able to listen to this before uh, the TV show airs. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming. Uh, this has been another fantastic episode of Movie Retakes. Uh, thank you, my brother, uh, for showing up. Always always a lot of fun. Yeah, and absolutely, uh, don't forget, if this does go up in the next few days, we do have that awesome Ghostbusters giveaway uh, going on right now. Or if you listen to this in the future, just follow our social channels. Chances are there's another giveaway of some kind going on. Don't forget mm -hmm. to enter those uh, and return daily for more opportunities to win. Fantastic. Don't forget to say Nerds Unite. Nerds Unite. There it is. What happens Bye, everybody. if the engine stops? We all freeze and die. But will it stop?